Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ward. Um, There's going to be a common theme to, uh, I think, all the talks that you're going to hear uh, when in people that are interested in looking at data look at sports. Um, we think that sports are going to teach us about the rest of the world because people that are performing in sports don't all of a sudden change when they're performing in the sport. They bring the same biases, same tendencies, and so forth to uh, being a referee or being a player that they have in the rest of their lives. Um, one of the most famous studies of sports was done by Tom Gilovich from Cornell, uh, who produced what a lot of people reacted to almost as strongly as the reaction to uh, the previous paper, uh, which is that there's no hot hand in basketball. Players are never hot. Uh, goes against every announcer you ever listen to. Announcers, of course, don't understand statistics at all. Uh, announcers will tell you this person is due to make the next shot because they're hot. That same announcer will tell you two minutes later he's due to make the next shot because he's overdue. Um, so they just like to say good things, I guess, uh, not understanding that they're contradicting their own logic from two minutes ago. The, the original hot hand paper, uh, Tom's a psychologist, and, and the point of the paper was quite simple, which is people cannot detect randomness. Uh, people see patterns where no patterns exist. That's the whole point. And um, one place that you might see a pattern or think you see a pattern where one doesn't exist is in people uh, having successful or unsuccessful outcomes. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about that type of thing. Um, the data I'm going to use is a new data set that was put together. I'll back up one slide. Uh, this is joint work that I've done with Sandy Wheel. Uh, Sandy has his own uh, sports uh, data analysis business. Um, we got data from stats. Uh, we have every play of every NBA game. Um, and we've taken those uh, individual events and built them up into what we call chances. So we think this is a most productive way to think about what goes on in a basketball game. Um, player or teams have possessions. A possession is while you are in possession of the ball. The next unit below a possession is a chance. So you may get multiple chances to score on a given possession. If you get an offensive rebound, um, if you are, if there's a non-shooting foul, you've ended that chance, but you get the ball back, you get another chance. So we have what we call a chances database. Uh, it took a lot of work. Uh, most of it Sandy did. Um, what we have are seven seasons worth of data by now. Um, just to give you an idea, there are about 450 events that uh, are recorded for every NBA game. Um, Typical NBA game, if you go from those events up to the next level of chance, uh, there are 226 times in a game on average when an NBA team has a chance to score. Um, there are fewer possessions than that because NBA teams have <coughs> multiple chances to score on a given possession. Okay, we're going to use, uh, I'm trying to make some especially good use of the data we have. So when we are going to look at successes and not successes in shooting, we're going to be able to control for a lot of things that other people haven't, uh, such as how did that chance start? And I'll show you some data that I think not related, or some results that are not related to the primary thing we're after, but maybe it'll give you a better appreciation about why Dennis Rodman is such a valuable player and why people that commit turnovers are so costly to have on your team. Um, but we're going to look at, we, we know exactly what was going on in the game uh, when these shots are taken. Okay. So, I'm going to talk about hot hands. I, I have to tell you what I'm talking about. And most of the time when I give this talk, people argue, you don't even know what a hot hand is. So I've now inserted, inserted this slide to claim that I do. This is an example of a hot hand. What do I mean by that? Well, the probability that a player makes a current shot while that player is hot, suppose that was 90%. That's pretty hot. The probability of making a shot when that player is not hot is 45%. Okay? That's the difference between being hot and not hot. Once you get hot, you stay hot for at least three shots. 
And then after that, the probability that you stay hot is 0.8, 80%. Once that thing gets going, it's going to continue. And then the last thing I need to describe the total probability state of what's going on here is that the probability of, once you're cold, a hot streak started. And in this example, I've made it 1.25%. Now, all those numbers above the line completely describe the probability space of what's happening. I can take that, I can use those numbers and compute things that we typically look at, um, like uh, how often is this person going to be hot? This person will be hot 8% of the time, okay? Once a hot streak starts, it lasts seven shots. This person will shoot on average across a whole season 48.6%. However, you can predict, because these hot streaks exist, you can predict whether this person will make their next shot or not. You look at what they did on their last shot, that's useful information. So if they made their last shot, chances are, a little bit higher, that they're in a hot streak. And you could use that information to say the probability they make the current shot is 51.2%. If they miss their last shot, it's less likely than average that they're hot, and so their shooting percentage drops to 46.2. The difference between those, that is, what they can shoot after making a shot versus before a shot, that difference is 5%. That's what we're going to look at, okay? Why do we look at that? Because that is a statistical creation that will happen across all different kinds of formulations of what being hot looks like. If I knew that that was the exact formulation above the line, I could go in and do statistical analysis on the top part and get very powerful results. Because I'm using information about what hot streaks look like. But I don't know what they look like. So I want to use the statistical technique that is going to be valid against all kinds of definitions of hot streaks. And all hot streaks have the property that's embodied in that last line. All definitions of hot streaks have that the probability of making a shot, having made the last one, is higher than the probability of making it before. Okay? Now, that's going to water down, in statistical terms, the power of my test. Okay? And those of you that read about sports and statistics, you probably read about Bill James. Bill James had a very interesting article maybe two years ago. It's called Out of the Fog. Bill does a lot of great work. He's not a statistician. All of a sudden, he wakes up one day and he says the fog cleared and he realized that everything he had done was a mistake. And the reason is he didn't understand hypothesis testing. He thought that if he tested a hypothesis and he failed to reject the hypothesis, that the hypothesis was true. That's not the way it works, of course, right? And so in the hot hand example, we usually, when we do statistics, set up the hot hand as the hypothesis to be tested. There is a hot hand. We fail to reject that. What does that mean? That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means we haven't found it yet, right? And so one of the things that you need to think about when you analyze a lot of the sports results is what's the power of your test? All these people that claim there is no hot hand, were they using tests that were, had any statistical power? Well, because I made up a particular definition of a hot hand, I can calculate the power of the typical test that's being done. And most tests, like the one that are done in this last line, are not very powerful. If there really was a hot hand, What's the probability I would miss it? Or what's the probability I would find it? Well, I would need at least 1,000 shots in order to get about a one-third chance of actually finding it. So these things are pretty hard to find, even when you have a pretty uh, strong evidence, when you know that the truth exhibits a pretty uh, strong hot air. All right. What do I have? Well, we've got lots of data, so we're not going to need to worry about power because I've got everything that's happened in the NBA over all these different seasons. We constructed a data set of the, uh, for us, a unit of account is a player season. So Kobe in one year is one observation. Kobe in the next year is a different observation and so forth. We have 49 uh, player seasons. We have 29 distinct players. We've divided them up by position, uh, the single most Interesting result to me is one where I show you how this varies by position. We have bigs, 
we have swings, and we have points. So basically, power forwards and centers go in the big category, points are points. Small forwards and shooting guards are uh, swing players. Um, our, our definition for inclusion, you had to have taken at least 1,500 shots in a season. Um, point guards don't shoot quite as much, so in order to get some point guards into the sample, uh, we had to lower the definition for them to 1,400. Um, you traded mid-season, you drop out. If there's another player on your team that shoots a lot, we drop you out because we want independent observations. We don't want Chris Bosch's shooting percentage affecting LeBron James, even though if Chris Bosch is the shooting really well, maybe the defense is adjusting, that may affect what goes on with, with LeBron James. So we want players on different teams uh, so that we can maintain the assumption of statistical uh, independence. We lose observations because players get fouled. We don't know when they get fouled and the shot go, uh, doesn't go in, whether it would have gone in had they been fouled. So even though we've got lots of data, we start losing observations. Um, and in the far right column, you'll see the number of observations that we actually use. So we only use observations where we have consecutive shots. Okay? And we lose uh, shots in the middle because people are fouled, shot doesn't go in. We're willing to assume that the foul does not make the shot go in. So if you get fouled and it goes in, we assume you would have made it in. There's the people. Uh, in the data. And here's kind of the, the what starts off the, the key results. So this is a 0, 1 left-hand side variable regression. It's a linear probability model. They work pretty well because we're in the mid-range of about 50%. What's the probability that you're going to make a shot? How is that affected by whether you made your last shot? Okay, in the first line, if your previous shot you made a jump shot, what does that do? It lowers the probability that you're going to make this shot by about 3.5%. Okay? Now, if there were a hot hand, we would expect exactly the opposite. A hot hand, if you made your last one, it's more likely you're in a hot streak, and when you're in a hot streak, the probability of making the next shot should go up. So this is exactly the opposite of a hot hand. Okay? And it matters what kind of shot you make. If you make a jump shot, it has a larger impact on the probability of you making the next shot than if you made a layup. Okay? So that's the basic. Does that result, much like uh, the previous talk, you kind of illustrate your result and you show that it still exists when you control for all kinds of other things. Uh, these are the other things that affect the probability of making shots. Um, the third line is what kind of a team are you playing against? So we have the, the uh, defensive field goal position, or sorry, field goal percentage for your opponent. That coefficient there of one, what does that mean? It means that if the team you're playing against has a defensive field goal position percentage which is 1% higher, then you, as one of our prolific scorers, your shooting percentage goes up 1%. So bad defensive teams are kind of equally bad against people that shoot a lot and people that shoot very little. The things that are kind of new in ours that people haven't talked about, how did your, how did your current chance start? And if your chance started with a turnover, your probability of making your next basket goes up 12%. Right? Why? Because the defense doesn't have time to get set. If you start with an offensive rebound, your probability of making a basket is 8% higher than otherwise would be the case. If you start with a defensive rebound, it's 4% higher. If your opponent made a basket, it's 1% higher. Higher than what? Well, the constant term there represents you start with a dead ball and you let the defense get completely set up. Okay? All of those things are important. You shoot better at home. You have about a one and a half percent higher shooting percentage when you play at home. All of that stuff matters, but it doesn't change our main result, which is a player that makes a shot, the probability to make the next shot goes down, not up. And as I said, we have 49 player seasons. What I'm giving you here is the average across those 49. So I'm trying to tell you on average how do NBA players perform. Am I getting that negative three and a half percent because of one or 